Hello, welcome to the workshop at the uh, Tobacco Farm Life Museum here in Kinley, North Carolina. This is a combination blacksmith shop, woodworking shop, and metalworking shop. Part of the farm life, you had to make your own repairs, do your own work, and, and also make tools when you needed them. My name's Randy Stoltz. I'm part of the uh, Triangle Area Blacksmiths of NC Havana. We're part of a uh, statewide association of blacksmiths. And today I'm just going to do a brief walkthrough of the blacksmith shop portion of this. In front of me you see probably the most iconic piece is the anvil. Anvil is a piece of steel we use to hammer on. Our other tool is a hammer. Along with that, the primary tools, here is the forge. Forge is our source of heat. We work by heating the metal up until it becomes plastic or moldable and then use the hammer and anvil to move the metal and shape it to where we want. The other tool here, this is, uh, you'll hear this called a blacksmith vise or post vise. And part of the reason I should have done this more here, you see this post is fully supported all the way down through here. It's made to clamp work in and hammer on it versus a machinist vise which frequently tend to break if you hammer hard on them. But your vise, your anvil, your forge. And the forge here, this is a fairly typical forge you would have seen on farms from really the, the late 1800s on up through the 50s. Every farm pretty much had one. This is a uh, either a hand crank bellows or a centrifugal uh, fan. It's geared in here, and when I pump here, you see I'm pumping air down up through the bottom of the forge. The more air, the more heat. Our fuel here is coal. And basically, we like to use bituminous or soft coal. It burns better than the anthracite or hard coal, which generally is pulverized and injected in a constant stream in like power plants and steam generation. <laughs> but here, we actually pile up the coal as it comes out of the ground called green coal, not because of the color, because it's unprocessed. That we heat it up and you see these vapors coming off, especially when I crank. Those are petroleum distillates burning out of the coal. And there you can see them coming off. What's left after you burn the petroleum distillates off is pure carbon, or called coke. Coke burns cleaner and hotter than green coal. I mean, reason being that it takes energy to vaporize those petroleum distillates. And again, I've got a piece of metal in here heating it up. But, let me see if we get this. I'm not quite hot enough here to give you an idea, but the idea, we heat the metal up. People are always talking about red hot. Red hot in steel is about a thousand degrees. Actually colder than we want to work. We want it bright orange to yellow. And the idea is I can hit in between the anvil and the hammer moved the steel to where I want it. And what I was doing there, hitting, rotating, hitting, rotating. One of the basic processes called drawing, it will draw out to a point. Hold the work at an angle, hold the hammer at an angle, and I'm working near the edge of the anvil so I'm not hitting the face of the anvil. And again, we're, we're down to a red color now 
down around 900 degrees, and that's how we look at the color. Tell the temperature. So you stick it back in and reheat. Again, if I needed to bend it or something like that, I might clamp it in a vise. Drawing is your basic technique to move steel out. You can also upset steel by heating it and hammering it back in and actually make the end thicker. And uh, again, you can see there I've driven this to a point. Not a big point, but just a rough point. And again, I'm holding it here with my bare hand. Steel is a conductor of heat, not a great conductor. Yes, it will eventually heat up down here. And normally, you would have a quench tub of water that to cool off the portions you don't need hot. You see the end is now thicker than it was. That's called upsetting. If you need a little more steel in the giver, I could heat it in the middle, hammer this in, and give me more metal there without welding it on. Welding would be your third major operation, which is I heat two pieces up to a very bright yellow, put them together, and then hammer them, and they were actually molecularly bond <laughs> and form a union. But again, I'm not going to demonstrate making things today. We're just going through the shop. Again, if I need to bend something, I can do it over the edge of the anvil. Uh, I can do it on the horn. This is uh, more of a London pattern anvil than a European style. This is probably more common in the United States than uh, much of Europe. The other tools we get into, I'm going to let that heat up just a bit, tongs. Tongs are basically handles for holding hot steel. And basically, you have a pair of tongs to fit certain tiles. These are flat jaw tongs for holding thin pieces of metal, and basically flat metal. This is a V-jaw tong. And this one is made specifically to hold quarter inch, three eighths inch square or round material in the jaws. So if I need bigger, I have the same style that holds half inch round or square. And again, the tongs are there to hold it when the metal gets too hold, hot to hold with your bare hand. Now let's talk about bending. I don't always use the horn of the anvil to bend. I can come here. and bend it over the edge and come back and hammer on. The, the anvil is useful for a lot of scrolls and things of that nature, but most of the time doing a straight bend, I go over the edge of the anvil. And in some cases that's preference. Same way if I need to cut that piece of steel, I could use a hacksaw. Again, the Romans had hacksaws. Not quite like this, but similar enough. Basically where you could saw the metal, but I'd have to cool it down to do that because the hot metal would damage the blade. Most time with blacksmith, we use what's known as a hot cutter. It's a chisel that fits in the square hole, which is called a hardy hole, and this is a hardy tool that I can heat the metal up, hammer down, and cut it 
while it's hot and then continue working. The small round hole in the top of the anvil is a pritchel hole. That's for punching holes in metal. Frequently, we don't drill a hole. Again, we'd have to cool the metal down, or especially if it's a uh, high carbon tool steel, we couldn't quench it and cool it down. We'd have to let it cool naturally so it'd still be soft enough to drill. Drills were expensive, hard to replace. We would take a punch and punch a hole in it. A punch spreads the metal out so you're not wasting any metal. You can actually punch a half inch hole in a half inch piece of steel. And, uh, and yes, you see me grab that gingerly just in case it gets warm. Uh, But there's any number of ways we can do this. I can, again, a lot of this shaping and stuff. And I never used the horn for that. And you're wondering why we have a burnt board here. <laughs> if we have a decorative piece, we put a texture on it, like a leaf pattern or something like that and need to shape it. If we hammer on here, we would hammer out our texture. We'll use a wood board <laughs> to do that. And it won't mar the uh, finished surface of the wood. So yeah, there's generally also a, a, either a stump or a board or something of that nature. But again, you see how tight that's, that little turn is and I never use the horn. It's again, Hammer control, moving it. And the same way, if you want to make that like a lollipop and center that scroll over the top of it, you can do it with a hammer, you can do it with the vise. But again, I want to heat the metal up. And the whole idea is we want to forge it bright orange to yellow. That's generally going to be in that 1800 degrees Fahrenheit to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Certain steels you actually forge hotter than that. But here, just to show the, uh, the vise, I can tighten up that scroll even further, but I can also bend it back. And again, I could have done that Now I've centered that on the top. And again, you're just moving the metal where you want it. And again, these, this is just a piece I'm showing you how to move the metal things. I can thin it out, make it bigger, longer. I can uh, thicken it to uh, give you more metal in this particular area. I can bend it, scroll it, and that matter. And most of the time I've been using the face of this hammer. This is, when I hit, each hammer is different, and uh, this is a cross pin. Cross pin, this is a regular, sort of slightly rounded face. If I hit up here, it can move a metal, but if I hit straight in place, it moves the metal 360 degrees wider. If I'm hitting flat on the anvil. If I hit with this side, the metal moves perpendicular to it, up and down, so I can make a piece wider without making it longer. You think you have a death grip on this hammer, you're swinging hard, no. You heat the metal up and you generally let, this is a uh, three pound, actually two and a half pound hammer. Um, but the idea is I literally hold it loosely and aim it and hit where I want. Now if I'm doing a big heavy piece of steel, yeah, I'll be going much harder and much higher, but the fact is you increase your velocity you increase the force significantly. But if you see here, that's called rebound. One of the advantages of a steel anvil, hardened steel anvil, 
When I hit this side, that rebound is working the opposite side of the metal. You're working two sides at once. And again, this is what we call mild steel. I could take this, heat it up, quench it. It's not going to harden. It's not going to hold an edge. There's not enough carbon in it to do that. To make a knife, a chisel, or something, we would use a different steel, a steel with a higher carbon content. In the same way, that once we move to that higher carbon content, which is common in, like say, knives, axes, uh, tools such as punches and chisels, we will heat it up to where a magnet won't stick to it. It's called its critical temperature. We then quench it and cool it quickly. It locks the carbon in a matrix that's very strong, very hard. You now have a very hard but brittle piece of steel. Again, we will heat that up to a much lower temperature, say 500 degrees or so, to temper it back or to make it stronger and less brittle but still hard. Again, most stuff, mild steel, you would use to make hinges, to make decorative items and things, simply because carbon steel was more difficult to produce up until they developed the Bessemer process in the late 1880s. Until then, steel was a matter of um, hand production and inconsistent qualities, especially if you're looking for harder carbon steels. And they were trade secrets in most in Eastern Europe and Middle Eastern countries under penalty of death on how they made their best steels. But here we have the basic operation, anvil or hard object. This could be, if you look at a sword maker's anvil, it doesn't have a horn on it. They don't need it. It's a square block of steel with a flat surface on it. Something to move on. You've got corners to roll things on. This, like say, a London pattern anvil has a hardy hole for tools and attachments so they can't rotate. You have a pritchard hole for punching holes. And the reason called a Pritchard hole is the punch used, the rectangular punch used to make uh, horseshoes is a Pritchard punch. And why do they use rectangular nails on horseshoes? Rectangular nails can't rotate. You wouldn't want it rotating in the horse's hoof. But like I say, after wire nails were designed, they were all round. Mm -hmm. But you can still get cut nails or hand forged nails and the square edges keep it from rotating. And this is an ash dump, by the way. You burn these ashes, there's always a metal bucket under it. You uh, blow her here, replace the bellows, really in the late 1800s. The bellows was a big wooden box with leather sides that you pumped manually, which is generally why he had apprentices and kids to do the heart, the, the, the labor intensive stuff. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned this morning, the apprentice's first job, he would come in the morning, open up the shop, and start the fire. So, it took me about 20 minutes to get the fire going this morning, but you get the fire, and if you notice, this is sort of a half hood, but it's a natural convection. Once I get the fire going and the heat going, the smoke will naturally go draw up the chimney away from you. You don't have a hood or anything hanging over it. They're just in your way. Yeah, you have a forge to you out there and it's 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. And you fire up the forge and heat up stuff even more. But you, you, you work year round in the same way. In the wintertime, it's actually hard to work because the anvil's so cold. As soon as you put the metal on it, it's a huge heat sink you would have to actually warm the anvil up. And sometimes I like to take a plate of steel, heat up in the forge, and then lay on the anvil to get it warm enough to start working. But back in the day, they would work and work all day long. Basic work triangle here, a vise, an anvil, and forge. This is your heat source. This, this is your uh, milling machine and, and lathe to move metal and then this is to clamp it in for your filing and finish work and and if you've got to do some heavy bending by yourself <laughs>